Hello everyone, welcome back to History 3560. In this video, we're going to discuss the U.S. military's role in the building of America's overseas empire. We'll start our discussion by considering U.S. foreign policy in the 1860s through the 1890s. We'll discuss the purchase of Alaska in 1867 and then the annexation of Hawaii which was accomplished in 1898. After that, we'll discuss the post-war U.S. Navy, its demobilization, and then its remobilization, and the evolution of its tactics and technology. Then we'll discuss the evolution of the U.S.'s land-based military, and we'll use the Spanish-American War of 1898 as a case study. Then we'll discuss the U.S. military's um, performance in the Spanish-American War, changes that were made to tactics and strategy, to rec recruitment, training, equipage, etc. We'll discuss the theaters of operations in the Spanish-American War, the Caribbean and the Pacific. And then we'll discuss um, a related topic, the U.S.-Philippines War, which began after the Spanish-American War in 1898 and would continue till about 1902. I've discussed some of these issues, uh, some of these developments in American history in previous videos, but in this video, we're really going to focus on uh, military history, uh, changes to um, US tactics, strategy, uh, technology, uh, and of course, um, the experiences of American military personnel during this period as well. The image on this slide is of African-American uh, buffalo soldiers, as they were often called. Um, it was very common for African-American soldiers to not receive uh, the newest uh, equipment and uniforms. Um, these soldiers are using older percussion cap operated carbines as opposed to uh, the newer bolt action rifles. You can see the percussion cap here. They're wearing the older uh, blue uniforms. During the Spanish-American War, the uniforms are going to be changed uh, from blue to khaki, but it's going to happen uh, very gradually in phases. So we'll start with some background about U.S. foreign policy in the 1860s through the 1890s. And this is important because during this period, even more so than other periods of American history, U.S. military personnel were involved in uh, American diplomatic decisions and in U.S. foreign policy, uh, not just in warfare, but in diplomacy as well. As the U.S. struggled to reconstruct the South and integrate the West, the subject of a previous video, American politicians, and in some cases military personnel, had dreams of building a overseas empire for the United States of America. There's a lot of reasons for this. First, um, as I discussed in previous videos, uh, empire was not a negative term. It was not a dirty word to Americans in the 1800s. Uh, for example, Thomas Jefferson, former president in the early 1800s, thought that America should be an empire for liberty or an empire of liberty. We often think of empires and imperialism as, as being uh, opposites, but to Americans in the 1800s, they didn't have uh, those negative connotations around the term empire. Uh, policymakers' plans to build an overseas empire would really be facilitated by the end of Reconstruction in 1877 and the defeat of uh, Native Americans by about 1890. Although some of uh, the overseas expansion does begin uh, before 1877. The image on this slide is of US Secretary of State William H. Seward. Um, he's discussing the purchase of Alaska with Russian and U.S. diplomats uh, about the year 1867. I've discussed uh, the U.S. purchase of Alaska in other videos, but I want to talk about it a little bit more here. From March to October of 1867, the U.S. Uh, worked on a purchase agreement uh, for buying Alaska from Russia. In the end, the U.S. would buy Alaska for about $7.2 million. Um, that's about two cents an acre. Um, 
it would be about $140 million in today's money. Uh, you can compare the Alaska Purchase of 1867 with the Louisiana Purchase of 1803. Um, Louisiana, uh, or the Louisiana Territory, was purchased for $15 million from France uh, at about a cost of $0.04 cents an acre, or about $342 million in today's money. So it's actually a, a pretty good deal uh, for the United States, even better than the Louisiana Purchase was in terms of land. Russia was interested in selling the territory because they needed uh, money to pay off debts from the Crimean War of the uh, 1850s. Also, very few settlers had gone to Russian Alaska. Um, it was mostly uh, traders who um, captured uh, seals and sold their fur. Um, William H. Seward hoped that um, Alaska could be used as a means to annex Canada. Seward was a, uh, an expansionist. He wanted to annex Canadian territory. Uh, even during the Civil War, William Seward uh, had uh, explored the idea of provoking a war with Great Britain over Canada because he believed that the Confederate States of America, the Confederacy, might come back into the Union, uniting with their brethren in the, in the North to fight uh, their old enemy, Great Britain. Obviously, that never happened, and the Confederacy is defeated in other ways. Contrary to popular opinion, um, Americans were generally uh, pretty happy with the Alaska Purchase. Uh, they thought it was a good deal, um, although some, some obviously did not. Some referred to it as Seward's Folly or Seward's Icebox. Uh, so there's always going to be a, a variety of opinions. But on the whole, uh, Americans tended to uh, support the Alaska Purchase. They thought it was a good deal, um, and they knew things like the seal, the, the seal fur trade were going to be very lucrative for American uh, businessmen. And later foreign policymakers, uh, most notably Henry Cabot Lodge, will explore uh, annexing Danish Greenland as a pretext for annexing Canada. So the dream of annexing Canada doesn't go away after William Seward is no longer in politics. The US, of course, does not annex Canada, uh, but the, uh, the purchase of, of Alaska really, really pays off uh, in 1898 with the discovery of gold in Nome, Alaska. And this leads to increased Anglo-American settlement in the region. And of course, Alaska becomes a state in 1959. Now we'll talk about another element of US foreign policy in the late 1800s, and that's the US annexation of Hawaii. In a previous video, I went into details about how uh, the, the Kingdom of Hawaii was dissolved and it was taken over by uh, mostly uh, white Euro-American uh, business interests. Uh, I won't go into more detail about that here. That happens about 1893. But in uh, the late 1890s, uh, the United States explores annexation of Hawaii. Um, some Americans opposed annexation, some supported it. Um, Hawaii had large uh, white, English, uh, and American and European populations um, and who had really worked on acculturating the indigenous Hawaiian population. The idea of annexation of Hawaii was more controversial than the annexation or purchase of Alaska had been. But Americans became more receptive to annexation as the 1890s progressed. Um, Americans were, wanted to keep up with uh, other empires in the Pacific. They wanted to keep up with uh, Britain, for example. They also were uh, concerned about Japan, a uh, rising imperial power in the Pacific. Some Americans were also concerned about the legality of annexation because of the circumstances by which um, the Hawaiian kingdom had been dissolved, and others, uh, for more racist reasons, opposed the annexation of Hawaii because they were concerned about uh, non-white indigenous Hawaiians becoming U.S. citizens. Many military elements, especially in the U.S. Navy, uh, wanted to uh, annex Hawaii. That way it could be used as a coaling station. Basically, coal would be stored in the Hawaiian Islands and U.S. ships would stop in Hawaii um, to load up on coal as they crossed the Pacific. Uh, 
And the image on this slide is actually from uh, Puck magazine, uh, sort of a satirical magazine that we talked about in previous videos. It shows a um, U.S. president uh, in the 18, late 1890s, William McKinley, overseeing the annexation of Hawaii, dressed as a, uh, a preacher, uh, presiding over a shotgun wedding between Uncle Sam, the United States, and a uh, Hawaiian person. Meanwhile, uh, the man holding the shotgun and dressed in a military uniform is John T. Morgan, who uh, was actually a former, a former military officer for the Confederacy. Uh, but he was a, a big supporter of annexation because um, he and others like him believed that Hawaii would be a very good naval base. So the annexation of Hawaii and the purchase of Alaska were foreign policy successes for the U.S., but there were some diplomatic foreign policy failures as well. Um, in the late 1860s, U.S. President Ulysses S. Grant during Reconstruction, Grant, of course, is a former Union general and career uh, U.S. Army officer before he became president. He was very concerned that uh, the Republic of Haiti uh, or some other European empire might try to invade the new independent Republic of Santo Domingo, what is now the Dominican Republic. And Grant uh, explored the idea of annexing Santo Domingo and turning it into a uh, U.S. state. Um, this was actually a very strategic decision on Grant's part. It's taking place during a uh, war called the Ten Years' War, which happens in uh, Cuba, as the Cubans try to revolt against Spain to get their independence. That war happens from 1868 to 1878. 1869, 1870, Grant is exploring annexation. The idea was the annexation of Santo Domingo might compel Cuba and Brazil to abolish slavery. Both of those uh, territories still had slavery at this point. Um, also, Grant was thinking that African Americans in the South might uh, want to go to Santo Domingo. They would leave the South and go to live in uh, Santo Domingo in the Caribbean. Uh, they could flee groups of the Ku Klux Klan that were persecuting black people in the South. So uh, Grant's plan to annex Santo Domingo is tied not only to foreign policy, pressuring uh, Cuba and Brazil to abolish slavery, preventing Santo Domingo from losing its independence, but also to domestic policy. It's kind of a part of Reconstruction by giving African Americans a safe haven in the Caribbean. Um, most of the Dominican people were of uh, African descent or of uh, mixed race descent. Uh, and some African Americans, including Frederick Douglass, actually supported this annexation. They thought it would be a good thing, not only for the people of Santo Domingo, but for African Americans in the U.S. Uh, most white Americans, though, both in both the Republican and the Democratic parties, were against annexation. Um, generally, people, um, white people at this point, did not want to bring non-white people into the U.S. And the Treaty of Annexation basically fails. Um, Santo Domingo does survive to become the Dominican Republic. It remains an independent state. Uh, there's a lot of reasons why uh, Grant's proposal failed. Some people who were actually sympathetic to Grant and the proposal just thought that Grant was corrupt. He was not being public enough about how the treaty was being uh, arranged, while others, of course, uh, opposed annexation for racist reasons. And although Santo Domingo, the Dominican Republic, will remain independent through the 19th century, the U.S. will, of course, invade and intervene in uh, Dominican politics in the 20th century. But that's beyond the focus of this course. So now we'll discuss uh, U.S. naval policy uh, from 1865 to the 1890s. We've discussed uh, the importance of strategic ports like Hawaii, so now we'll discuss some of the things the U.S. Navy was doing during this period. After the Civil War, the U.S. Navy mothballed most of its ships. The fleet went from being about 700 to about 52 ships. Very, very small fleet. Uh, many of the ironclads and uh, steam-powered wooden vessels, initially they were decommissioned. The U.S. Uh, in the late 1860s and into the 1870s wanted to save money by switching to uh, wooden sail-powered vessels. And they would use old smoothbore artillery. And of course, all of these technologies are obsolete at this point. They were made obsolete uh, 
before and during the Civil War. Um, Wooden-powered ships could not survive attacks from ironclads. Steam-powered vessels could carry a lot more artillery than sail-powered vessels, and artillery is going to be increasingly important in uh, uh, naval warfare from the 1800s and on into the 20th century. Naval uh, warfare, naval history, um, really has to be studied in terms of technology. In the U.S., it wanted to save money. It wanted to focus on reconstruction, on Indian wars. And there were people in American society who still believed that the U.S. did not really need a Navy in peacetime, that old Jeffersonian idea. They believed that the U.S. should just focus on being a continentalist power, a power in North America and, and not overseas. But certain events uh, in, in history convinced uh, U.S. naval officers and U.S. politicians and policymakers that this plan of mothballing the Navy was not realistic. Uh, in 1873, there was the USS Virginianus affair. A U.S. ship was running supplies to the Cuban rebels who were trying to get independence from Spain in the Ten Years' War. The Spanish captured the uh, old Virginianus. They executed... Um, crew members of the ship, U.S. citizens. Really, it was a, a bad situation. It made the U.S. Navy's policies look very bad, and it convinced policymakers that they needed to not mothball the Navy, but actually uh, expand it and modernize it. Remember, when uh, the U.S. had mothballed its Navy in the early 1800s during Jefferson's presidency, that led to um, raids by the Barbary states, uh, only for the U.S. Navy to have to rebuild its strength. So the U.S. Navy will begin to really rebuild itself um, by the 1880s. Also, there's uh, intellectual movements within uh, naval command. Uh, naval doctrine and command are going to be uh, advanced significantly, largely due to uh, works of history. Um, Alfred uh, Thayer Mahan, uh, right here, he called for the building of a larger modern U.S. Navy to secure na national interests on the high seas. Basically, uh, defense of America through offense. And uh, the first U.S. battleships, or uh, proto-battleships, what are usually called pre-dreadnoughts, were developed by about 1892. The U.S. Uh, Navy will use its uh, now expanding and modernizing Navy to flex its naval muscles. It will make a treaty with the Hermit Kingdom of uh, Korea in 1882. Korea uh, was impressed by the strength of the U.S. Navy, and they were looking to make alliances with the U.S. against Japan. Japan had uh, forcibly uh, opened up Korean ports uh, a few years earlier. Uh, there, of course, were more um, belligerent uh, moments of, of the U.S. Navy being used uh, for U.S. foreign policy interests. Uh, in, in an example of what is often called gunboat diplomacy, uh, the USS Boston a uh, pre-dreadnought vessel unloaded uh, sailors and marines in the Hawaiian Islands in 1893. This was during the, uh, the coup that dissolved the Hawaiian monarchy. The sailors and marines unloaded by the Boston did not get involved in the coup. They did not support um, the, uh, the Hawaiian um, insurrectionists. But they did, uh, by just being there, basically they prevented the uh, royalists uh, those who supported the Hawaiian monarchy from resisting the insurrectionists. Um, Alfred Thayer Mahan, who I mentioned before, he wrote a work of naval history called The Influence of Sea Power Upon History, 1660 to 1783. And this work of uh, naval history, one of the really the first uh, works of naval history ever written, would inspire European and American policymakers um, to really invest in naval technology and build larger navies. And one person who's really going to be inspired by Mahan's work is Assistant Secretary of the Navy uh, Theodore Roosevelt, who will, of course, become a U.S. President. We'll talk more about Roosevelt later on in the video. This is the U.S. Boston, 1884. It's a steel hull cruiser and um, it's a steam and sail powered vessel. It has sails, but it relies primarily on its uh, steam boilers. Its hull is made of steel, which is heavier than wood. 
Um, the engine uh, and boiler technology was improving, so heavier ships that were more um, better protected and made of steel were being manufactured from the 1880s on. Um, this is the U.S. Boston's uh, sailors patrolling the streets of uh, Hawaii or the Hawaiian Islands in uh, 1893. These, these sailors did not actually take part in the coup, but they were there um, basically providing security and uh, they prevented the royalists from fighting back against the insurrectionists. And so, of course, uh, Hawaii then uh, ceases to be a monarchy, and just a few years later, it's going to be annexed by the U.S. So this is an example of, of gunboat diplomacy. This is the USS Texas, 1892. This is the first uh, American uh, pre-dreadnought or proto-battleship. And it's a proto battleship because it has several turrets. Um, turrets are one of the defining features of battleships. You can see there's two turrets, uh, two large turrets here, and some smaller turrets uh, at the bow and at the stern. And of course, the hull of the ship is made of steel. Here are some stats about the USS Texas, uh, which are relevant. Her size was 308 feet, uh, bow to stern uh, by 64 feet by uh, 24 feet. So 308 feet long, uh, about 64 feet wide, and she drew about 24 uh, feet of water. Uh, she was propelled by two uh, coal power propeller engines. Uh, she had electric lights. Her maximum speed was about 17.8 knots, so faster than um, older vessels uh, that had weaker engines, but not as fast as some of the cruisers that were being built at the time, which could go more like 18 or 19 knots. Um, she carried 30 guns and four torpedo tubes and several turrets. Uh, these turret uh, guns, of course, were a lot larger. They were not being used to make broadsides, uh, broadsides being multiple small guns uh, along the sides of a ship. Uh, now you have fewer, larger artillery pieces that can be moved on turrets to target uh, enemy vessels from, in some cases, miles away, as opposed to up close with broadsides. So naval technology is evolving significantly in the late 1800s, and the U.S. has now gone from trying to mothball its navy to instead build a larger navy that keeps up with uh, developing technology. As I said before, this ship is a pre-dreadnought or a proto-battleship. The, the first dreadnought is the HMS Dreadnought of 1906. This is uh, an armored cruiser known as the USS Maine. Uh, from my previous videos, you'll know this is a very, very famous ship. It was sunk in uh, the harbor of Havana in 1898, and this was the flashpoint uh, that led to the U.S. entering the Spanish-American War. But as you remember from that video, there were many other factors that contributed to war between Spain and the U.S. Um, the sinking of the USS Maine was just the event that led to Americans volunteering to uh, fight in the war. It provided the exact, as we would say, uh, casus belli or cause of the war. And of course, there is some controversy as to how the vessel sank, uh, whether its sinking was a accident or if it was a planned event. I discussed some of those things in a previous video, but this is what uh, the USS Maine looked like before it uh, sank. So I want to touch on uh, the evolution of U.S. naval uniforms from the 1860s to about 1900. As I've mentioned many times in this class, um, Equipment, including uniforms worn by militaries, is a reflection not only of uh, their mission and of their duties as, as military personnel, but also the values of the culture from which they have come. And so what you see is that across the uh, late 1800s into the 1900s, um, U.S. naval uniforms become a lot more practical and professional, but they also become better suited for tropical climates as the U.S. is expanding and building its overseas empire and the Navy is engaging in operations in the Hawaiian Islands and in the Caribbean, etc. These are uniforms from about the Civil War 
Uh, you can see they look a lot like uh, army uniforms worn by uh, uh, soldiers. But you know, as time goes on, uh, the uniforms are more professionalized. They're still uh, sort of showy um, you know, in dress uniforms. Dress uniforms are still fa fairly showy. But by the turn of the century, um, both dress uniforms and uh, undress uniforms become a lot simpler, a lot less um, uh, ornate. Also, white uniforms are issued uh, in tropical environments. And uh, US sailors still wear white uniforms in tropical environments or in summer. And that's a tradition that has uh, continued to this day. Now we'll discuss the Spanish-American War, uh, which is a very short conflict uh, that was within a much larger conflict between Spain and its uh, colonies. Uh, the war was fought by the U.S. against Spain from April 21st to about August 13th, 1898, so uh, basically a summer. In 1897, uh, just a year or so before the war, the U.S. regular army, the professional army, had only about 28,000 troops. Um, according to German military theorists, that made it too small to even be considered a army based on the size of the United States, uh, 63 million people in the U.S. by 1890, and then of course the massive um, uh, territorial uh, spread of the United States of America. Um, Republican President uh, William McKinley initially wanted to avoid war with Spain. Um, he was a veteran of the U.S. Civil War. He knew the horrors of war, uh, but he looked at the uh, war that was going on uh, in Cuba, especially since 1895 and 1896 in the Philippines, and he saw that the American people were turning uh, in favor of war against Spain. There were a lot of uh, war crimes being committed by the Spanish against the uh, Cuban and Filipino uh, insurgents. And even though Spain had promised to give its, uh, some of its colonies autonomy and uh, it promised to uh, basically prevent war crimes, Americans still wanted to go to war with, with uh, Spain. All they needed was a pretext for going to war and the sinking of the USS Maine provided uh, the specific flashpoint they needed to go to war. The army wanted to uh, increase its size. It wanted to have 50,000 troops. But instead, it got well over 200,000, about 220,000 to be exact. And that included troops taken from the, the U.S. National Guard, uh, which had basically absorbed the militias, and then volunteers, people who had uh, no military experience, but volunteered to serve uh, for the duration of the war. Much like the U.S.-Mexican War in the 1840s. And of course, in the Civil War, in which the majority of soldiers who actually fought were volunteers. So the United States had minimal intelligence on the strength of the Allied insurgents in, in uh, the Caribbean and the Philippines. They had a little bit of a better idea of the size of the Spanish force, but not enough intel to really um, uh, plan ahead the way they needed to. Nonetheless, though, um, the war is a victory for the United States. It was called a splendid little war in the words of uh, a volunteer leader, Theodore Roosevelt. There was a lot of enthusiasm and eagerness for war, thanks to uh, yellow journalism, journalism that was very biased against Spain. Um, there was also a desire to help uh, uh, the people of Cuba, especially fight against Spain. Spain, of course, is an old enemy of the United States. And there's a desire for uh, imperial expansion that will come as a result of the, of, of the war. Uh, the U.S. has a fairly quick victory against uh, the Spanish, whose military is uh, very overextended across the world. Spain is fighting in the Caribbean, far from uh, the homeland in Spain, and they're fighting in the Pacific in the Philippines. They're also there, a lot of their technology is, is uh, out of date, in some cases uh, over 100 years out of date. And it's a very, very much an uphill battle for, for the Spanish. Although it is a quick victory for the United States, there were certain problems with how the U.S. military operated, which we're going to explore. Um, early historians of the Spanish-American War tended to have a positive opinion of why the U.S. fought the war. Um, the idea that the Americans were helping the people of, of Cuba and the Philippines and Puerto Rico uh, free themselves from the Spanish Empire, 
but more recent scholarship is a lot more cynical. Uh, they'll point to what happens in the years after the war, uh, Puerto Rico becoming a territory of the United States, Cuba being independent, but uh, there being a strong U.S. influence in its politics, and of course, the Philippines being made a territory of the United States, um, and then the Filipino people fighting against the U.S. in the U.S.-Philippines War. So the military does defeat Spain, uh, but Spain is a, a rather weak opponent. Um, the U.S. military's logistics were very disorganized during the war. Uh, the equipment was poor. It was not standardized. Rations were very uh, bad, in some cases tainted with uh, toxic chemicals. And uh, there were about 5,400 deaths in the war. Less than 400 of those deaths were true combat deaths. Most people who died in the Spanish-American War died of diseases. Uh, especially the uh, volunteers who had very little military discipline and didn't keep their camps uh, clean enough. So there were some lessons, of course, the U.S. Uh, military was able to learn from the Spanish-American War. Um, it went from being too small, uh, 28,000 troops, to being way too big, over 200,000 troops. It could not mobilize and properly equip that many people that quickly. Uh, William McKinley, as president, he thought that it was actually a good thing to drastically grow the size of the army. He looked at the Civil War, and he believed that um, the, U the Union did not have a big enough army in the beginning, but he, he wanted to have a large um, U.S. volunteer force to defeat Spain. So the lesson that ultimately was learned in the Spanish-American War was that the U.S. professional army needed to be kept uh, at a larger size because it would be too difficult to bring in a lot of volunteers. And the Spanish-American War, although it was a victory, really showed the problems with trying to grow your, your military too quickly. This is a uh, Puck Magazine image of uh, Colonel, uh, volunteer Colonel uh, Theodore Roosevelt. He led a uh, volunteer cavalry regiment, most of whom actually fought dismounted because their horses didn't arrive in time, logistical problems. Um, Roosevelt had very limited military experience. He'd spent some time in the National Guard, but that was about it, and yet he was a colonel. And we've talked about the Battle of San Juan Hill, the experiences of fighting in that battle in a previous video. So we're going to focus on um, kind of the big picture of the military operations in the Spanish-American War in this video. These maps illustrate uh, U.S. military operations in uh, the Caribbean theater, specifically in, in Cuba. Um, Cuba was where uh, a rebellion against Spain had been ongoing since 1895. Uh, William Shafter was the commander of U.S. forces in this region. He took his troops from Tampa, Florida, down the coast of Cuba to um, the, the Santiago area, and that was where he deployed. Meanwhile, the Spanish um, uh, troops led by Arsenio Linares, they received reinforcements from Spain, but not enough reinforcements to stop the, uh, the U.S. advance and capture of Santiago. So now we'll talk about some of the other commanders uh, in the U.S. Army during the Spanish-American War. Uh, there was uh, Joseph, or Fighting Joe Wheeler, uh, in his 60s. He was uh, definitely an old man at this point in his life. He's actually a former Confederate general, but he was brought in as a commander because he had military experience. Also, a Southern commander would have led uh, more Southerners to volunteer to fight in the war. At this point in the 1890s, Southern people are still very suspicious of the U.S. Army because the U.S. Army was the Union Army. It defeated the Confederate Army. And then the U.S. Army uh, occupied the South during Reconstruction, which at this point, Reconstruction ended only about 20 years earlier. So former Confederates like Wheeler will inspire Southerners to take part in this war in addition to Northerners. Um, some of the other commanders are um, uh, Leonard Wood, who uh, is promoted to uh, uh, Brigadier General. He initially commands the, the first uh, U.S. Cavalry Volunteers, better known as the Rough Riders. After he is pr promoted, it's taken over by Teddy Roosevelt, who had minimal uh, military experience. By the way, um, Wheeler will also take part in the U.S.-Philippine War and will be accused of committing uh, war crimes against Philippine insurgents. Uh, 
a charge that he vehemently denied, but even other Americans said um, he authorized um, uh, war crimes. Wheeler also had offered, authored several books on military history and strategy, so he was an experienced officer, uh, even though one of the other reasons he was brought on was to inspire um, Southern men to take part in the war. Other important commanders, William Shafter, who we mentioned before, who was a reasonable um, uh, tactical commander, although he did make some mistakes. He really struggled with logistics, though, which is a big problem uh, in this war. Uh, General Nelson Miles, he oversees the capture of Puerto Rico. If you remember, we discussed Nelson Miles in a previous video. He took part in the uh, Indian Wars. Also, there's naval officers like Admiral George Dewey, who will play a big role in the Pacific theater of operations, along with um, General uh, Wesley Merritt, who are, is also a uh, Pacific theater officer. And in all of these theaters, uh, the U.S. will partner with indigenous and local assets in Cuba, Puerto Rico, or the Philippines um, to help them achieve victory. Although scholars tend to argue that um, the U.S. did not take enough advantage of its uh, indigenous allies during the conflict. Women also took part in the Spanish-American War, serving in a variety of capacities. Uh, women served in the anti-Spanish, uh, especially the Cuban insurgencies, um, and were called mambisas. Um, this is an image of uh, one at left. Um, typically, uh, for the United States, women did not serve in a combat capacity. They usually served uh, in the, the medical corps as, as nurses. Uh, and they often served on hospital ships um, that would be stationed outside of uh, um, harbors that would deal with the sick and the, the wounded from the battles. Duty on these hospital ships, however, could be very hazardous. Um, you know, high heat in the, the Caribbean and the Pacific, cramped spaces where accidents are very likely, uh, mosquito-borne illnesses, um, disease was the greatest killer in this war. I should add, though, that uh, overall deaths from disease are still um, lower than other conflicts in American history. Um, soldiers in the Spanish-American War had about a 5% chance of dying of disease. This is largely due to um, advances in germ theory and sanitation by the 1890s. At the same time, though, doctors and scientists are still just getting around to discovering the idea that mosquitoes spread diseases like malaria and yellow fever. Um, uh, Clara Mas, a uh, nurse who took part in the Spanish-American War on the American side, um, after the war, she actually volunteered to be bitten by a mosquito carrying uh, yellow fever in 1901, so this is after the war, and uh, she dies. But because of her, her death, her sacrifice, uh, doctors are able to discover that mosquitoes do in fact spread diseases like yellow fever. This map here shows the uh, American advance on the city of Santiago. Uh, this here is the Battle of San Juan Hill, which takes place early in the battle, July 1st, uh, 1898. After uh, the, the hills, San Juan Hill and the nearby Kettle Hill are captured, um, the U.S. settles in for a siege of Santiago. Uh, they are at the same time partnering with uh, their Cuban allies who will guard the north side of the city. Uh, the Spanish defenders will actually try to break out of um, the American siege, which is a uh, not a good idea, but they'll try it anyway. And this will lead ultimately to the United States capturing uh, the city of Santiago, and that will lead to the U.S. capturing Cuba and taking it from Spain. U.S. Uh, high command and soldiers, they initially had a pretty positive view of the Cuban uh, rebels, the Cuban insurgents, but over time their opinion of the Cuban insurgents uh, decreased. They did not like the fact that a lot of the Cuban insurgents were uh, of African or mixed race ancestry, and uh, they didn't really use their, their Cuban assets to uh, the best, um, in, the, in the best ways that they could have.
But in the end, uh, the U.S. does manage to capture Santiago, although a lot of the, the soldiers are struggling with diseases uh, as they're uh, besieging the city. But they do manage to capture uh, Santiago about two weeks later. During the battle, or during the siege, rather, uh, William Shafter will actually consider withdrawing, though, because of how bad uh, diseases were, and also just because of logistical problems. He was worried his troops were not going to have enough uh, food, enough rations, as they besieged the city. But in the end, they, uh, they do succeed against the Spanish. So now we'll discuss um, operations in the Pacific and in Puerto Rico. After the uh, capture of... Cuba, uh, Puerto Rico can be captured by the U.S. Uh, General Nelson Miles oversees the capture of uh, Puerto Rico, which is very successful for the U.S. Uh, they, they have very minimal casualties in a couple of skirmishes. Uh, capturing a, of, of Puerto Rico is much easier than the capture of Cuba for the U.S. Over in uh, the Philippines, the uh, U.S. Army and Navy are part of a joint task force. Uh, that unites with um, indigenous uh, Filipino people um, led by uh, General Emiliano Aguinaldo. Uh, they work to defeat um, the Spanish occupation uh, led by Don Fermin Juadenes. Uh, in May of 1898, so fairly early on, before, uh, before Cuba is even captured, the U.S. will sink the Spanish fleet off the coast of Manila. They just their, their ships by this point were a lot more advanced than those of the Spanish. And then in August of 1898, technically after the war has ended, the U.S. will capture uh, the city of Manila. And this in some ways actually angers uh, the Filipinos, their Filipino allies who felt that the U.S. had taken too much credit for um, uh, defeating the Spanish. And it's going to lead, uh, among other issues, to the uh, U.S.-Philippines War uh, of basically of 1898 to 1902. So now I'll mention some of the uniforms and equipment used by the Army and the U.S. Marine Corps during the Spanish-American War and then the later uh, U.S.-Philippines War. The U.S. Army uh, had begun to uh, call for uh, the issuing of khaki tropical uniforms. Uh, these are made of canvas as opposed to wool, which was the common kind of material for these blue uniforms. You know, these khaki canvas uniforms are going to be a lot more comfortable for soldiers deployed to tropical regions. But the rapid mobilization because, uh, from the Spanish-American War prevents these uh, khaki uniforms from being issued to everyone. A lot of the volunteers, actually, who just joined the military, they often get the better, uh, nicer uh, khaki uniforms. Uh, in, in pictures, you see Theodore Roosevelt wearing the uh, uh, khaki um, canvas tropical uniforms. You also see uh, Roosevelt wearing older blue uniforms as well, just because the equipment was very mismatched uh, because of logistical challenges. You know, rapid mobilization makes logistics more difficult. That's a theme throughout military history. Um, the U.S. was trying to phase out blue uniforms. Uh, you know, blue was the color of, of U.S. uniforms predominantly since the Revolution, the American Revolutionary War. Uh, but these khaki uniforms, not only uh, are they cooler, they, they are not as hot. They're also a neutral color, which makes the wearer less of a target. This is important as um, uh, high-powered rifles, uh, bolt-action rifles with a higher rate of fire, uh, long-range artillery, um, breech-loading artillery, even machine guns are being used in warfare now. Soldiers need to uh, be less conspicuous. Uh, for covers, uh, soldiers wear brimmed campaign hats, uh, like this uh, African-American soldier here. These are very, actually very practical for fighting in tropical regions to keep off the tropical sun. Uh, gaiters are often issued to uh, soldiers that are not wearing boots. These gaiters prevent their trousers from being torn by thorns and uh, jungle underbrush. Um, of course, the uh, standard issue rifle is the Krag uh, Jorgensen rifle, but a lot of soldiers use older, older rifles because of the challenges of properly um, equipping all of these new troops. 
And as I mentioned, in some cases, the regular uh, professional soldiers like an African-American Buffalo soldier, they're left with worse equipment than the new volunteers who get the newest equipment because they just joined. Things like grooming regulations, they become a lot stricter uh, by this point. Um, soldiers and sailors and Marines have much shorter hair than they did in previous decades. Facial hair becomes a lot less common unless it's a, a small mustache. Although on campaign, you often see soldiers, uh, you know, having beards and things like that because discipline on campaign is often lower. And a lot of the soldiers are volunteers who want to live uh, more like civilians, even when they're in the military. This is the Model 1895 Browning machine gun. It's an automatic weapon. Um, it uses gas from spent bullets to um, expel uh, casings and to bring in the next round from the magazine. It's different than the older Gatling gun, which was crank operated. It was an automatic weapon powered by a crank. This is um, this this weapon uses uh, gases, uh, much like a, a, a more like a modern machine gun. And it saw some service uh, in the Spanish American War, having been developed just a few years before. But older Gatling guns are going to be used as well because a variety of equipment is being used because of the rapid mobilization of uh, the U.S. military. Just, um, here are some reproductions of uh, uniforms worn by soldiers during the war. You can see the older blue uniforms uh, are accompanied by the newer khaki uniforms. You can see uh, bolt action rifles, which are the uh, the new technology they're supposed to be standard issue but oftentimes older much older uh, percussion lock uh, arms are issued as well just because the challenge of the logistics um, the logistical challenges of of equipping such a such an ar a large army so quickly um, lead to a lot of non-standard weapons being used and obsolete weapons being used even by the united states uh, during the spanish american war Still, though, it's not enough to stop the U.S. from winning. And as I mentioned on a previous slide, volunteers often got um, the new uniforms more quickly uh, because they had just joined the service. So they were receiving the newest uniforms. In some cases, African-American soldiers, the so-called Buffalo soldiers, were left with the older blue uniforms. Um, this was done mainly as a, out of expediency in the Spanish-American War. It made more sense just equip uh, the new volunteers and let the regular soldiers use the, uh, the arms and uniforms and equipment they already had. But uh, what you'll see in later conflicts in the 20th century is that African-American soldiers often are not given uh, the newest and best equipment. Uh, this is definitely going to be a problem in World War I, uh, but we're not going to discuss uh, World War I in this course. So now we'll discuss uh, the U.S.-Philippines War strategy and tactics. Uh, the U.S.-Philippines War begins officially on February 4th, 1899. There had been tensions between the U.S. and the Filipino people in 1898, but the shooting really gets going in early 1899. Although, as I mentioned, the Filipino people had not been happy with how the U.S. had handled the capture of Manila. They felt that the U.S. had uh, not treated them as equal partners uh, during the war, which arguably was true. The uh, U.S.-Filipino War ends on July 4th, 1902, uh, although there is going to be isolated pockets of fighting um, until 1914. I discussed the experience of fighting in the, the U.S.-Philippines War in a different video, so I won't uh, repeat myself here. I'll just recap some of the uh, observations we can make about uh, the general course of the U.S.-Philippines conflict. The U.S. was able to fight and ultimately prevail over the uh, Filipino insurgents slash revolutionaries because they used tactics and strategies that they had been employing for over a century against uh, Native Americans with uh, success. They exploited divisions within Filipino society to keep the Filipinos from uniting against the US. Uh, 
the U.S. was aware that not all Filipinos agreed with what the revolutionaries wanted, so they made sure to uh, keep the Filipino people divided. They would make alliances with Filipinos who supported U.S. rule, and they would uh, deploy these uh, allied Filipinos as scouts and uh, to gather intelligence about the Fil Filipino insurgents. And then uh, the U.S. would use irregular warfare to compel hostile insurgents to surrender. They would destroy uh, food supplies, uh, bases of operations, uh, towns and villages that were loyal to uh, the insurgents as a way of uh, leading the insurgents to surrender. And as I mentioned in a previous video, there were things that we would consider war crimes today that were uh, done by U.S. troops. But there were war crimes uh, committed uh, by both sides during during this conflict so i i'm just discussing the general course of the war and the general tactics and strategy that the u.s used to uh, uh defeat the filipino insurgents and a lot of these tactics and strategies they'd used in previous wars against native americans conclusion the U.S. Army was victorious in uh, the Spanish-American War and the subsequent U.S.-Philippines War uh, due to the initial enthusiasm of its volunteers, uh, the training and professionalism of its regular officers and uh, regular enlisted personnel, and then um, generally superior technology with some exceptions, and then alliances with local and indigenous assets, even if those alliances did eventually fall apart. There were, of course, some long-term uh, issues uh, with how uh, the mil U.S. military operated in these conflicts. And these uh, issues have been a, a subject of discussion throughout this course. Many of these issues actually predate the, uh, the, the United States. They uh, go back to colonial times. Uh, there's a lack of discipline amongst uh, citizen soldiers, amongst uh, militiamen and volunteers. And then there's a um, reticence to properly fund and equip troops, um, rational military considerations, giving soldiers the best kind of equipment, giving sailors the best kind of equipment and ships. Often they are uh, overridden by uh, policymakers who want to just save money and use older recycled equipment, even if it's not as good. Also, the U.S. military's mission in the Spanish-American War and the subsequent Philippines conflict was not just about ensuring national security, it was about building an American empire, specifically an overseas empire. And of course, uh, as, as often was the case, even as the U.S. military is um, securing the common defense, providing for the common defense for the United States, it's also uh, taking part in American expansionism it's taking part in building uh, an American empire, both on uh, the United States, uh, on North America, and then of course now at this point overseas. And the building of these um, um, territories, uh, the construction of the American empire comes at the expense of older European empires and then local and indigenous people. So that's a theme we see in uh, U.S. military history during this period as well. So in the end, although there are some differences um, in U.S. military policy in the late 1800s, there's a lot of uh, continuities as well. Continuities in terms of the uh, professionalism of the regular army, the technology uh, that's being used, the importance of technology, the importance of uh, local and indigenous alliances. Uh, there's issues, um, the lack of discipline amongst uh, volunteer citizen soldiers. Uh, even as the US has new technology, there's uh, a resistance to uh, pay for this new technology and equip troops properly. And then uh, the US military, its mission is not just national security and the common defense, it's also building an empire, an empire that comes at the expense of other people.